Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another edition of Felony Friday, a weekly show here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Of course, every single episode on Felony Friday, we strive to expose injustice in the broken criminal justice system, and we share stories, stories of felons who have overcome tremendous injustice, tremendous odds in order to find success in uh, in society, success after prison. And my guest today is no different. In fact, my guest today is probably the most successful felon that I've had on this show. I don't actually, I don't think there's any probably about it. I think that's probably a fact. My guest is going to be Dave Dahl, the co-creator of Dave's Killer Bread, which has a cult following. I love it too. It's fantastic. I'll introduce Dave in just a minute. Before I do that, I just want to remind you guys, this is only one of three shows that we have here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Every week we kick off with a show hosted by Mark Clare on Monday. It's our longest running program and our flagship program. And Mark interviews leaders in the libertarian movement. He hosts roundtable discussions talking about everything from politics to um, culture to all kinds of different interesting subjects. We had a couple weeks ago, we had our Liberty Draft where we drafted different, uh, it's really a Liberty fantasy team where we're trying to pick who are the movers and shakers in the Liberty movement going forward and who will see their stock rise the most uh, in the lead up to 2020. And Wednesday, Wednesday show is hosted by Brian McWilliams. It is called Electric Liberty Land. And Brian does a fantastic job with it. Sometimes it's a solo show. Sometimes he brings the guests on. But every single time, no matter what, I can guarantee you that Brian is going to bring you some angry, angry rants. But it's also funny. In fact, we call it your weekly dose of culture, comedy, and liberty. So check both those shows out, and you can get those two shows and my show by subscribing to the Lions of Liberty podcast feed wherever you find podcasts. I think it's probably everywhere, and it's on YouTube as well. The video for this episode will be on YouTube, and you can find all that stuff linked to nice and neat along with links from the show at lionsofliberty.com slash ff154 because this is episode 154 uh that's all i got let's get rolling with today's show my guest today on felony friday is dave Dahl. dave is the co-creator of dave's killer bread uh in my humble opinion one of the Best tasting and probably the healthiest bread out there. I'm not an expert in bread, but maybe we can learn about that from Dave. We'll ask him some questions. But uh, prior to his his breakthrough in the uh, the bread industry, Dave served four different prison sentences for crimes ranging from burglary to armed robbery for drug dealing. After this fourth time in prison, Dave turned his life around and got back into the family bi- family bakery business. And uh, from there, uh, the rest is history, really. Took uh, Dave's Killer Killer Bread, made it a successful brand. And as I've talked about before, on this show, one of my goals is to bring on people who have really made mistakes and got a second chance and took advantage of, of that second chance. I'm all about giving people like Dave a platform. So, Dave, welcome to Felony Friday. Hey, it's a privilege. It's an honor, man. Thanks. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. And, you know, I, I had no idea that uh, – you know, the history behind Dave's Killer Bread until, I don't know, just this ad popped up on my timeline, probably right before I contacted you, reached out to you, it, talking about your story. I forget. It was some some news outlet had done a uh, done a piece on you, and, you know, I, they were talking about your past and also how you brought people with a criminal background on to work for you when you still when you still uh, owned Dave's Killer Bread. I understand that you, you sold it a few years ago, right? Right. Uh, in two days, two separate events. It took, it took two events to sell it. Yeah. Okay. Finally, uh, out in 2015, forget. Okay. We can get into that, but let's, I mean, let's start sort of at the beginning and work our way through. So one thing I like to, you know, start with my guests is really get a feel for their background, where they grew up, things like that. So just give us like the, uh, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Different, different things like that from early in your life. I grew up in East Portland uh, and Gresham, and 
That's uh, Portland, Oregon, of course. And uh, I I went to Seventh Day Adventist schools. I went to Seventh Day Seventh Day Adventist church, and everything revolved around that. Uh, plus, my dad had a bakery, and we worked in the bakery. So um, I was kind of all over the place school wise, but it was all Seventh Day Adventist until my sophomore year, and I started wanting to uh, to branch out and figure something out. I, I, I was no longer drinking the Kool-Aid. So like, what, I guess in a nutshell, for people out there who don't know what a, maybe what the difference is between a traditional Christian, a Catholic Presbyterian, and a Seventh-day Ad, Ad, Adventist, what's the, what are some of the differences? The uh, Seventh Day Adventists are, are much more about, they're very much about not uh, joining up in the world, in the worldly, worldly things. And they're also, it, that's kind of hard to understand, I guess, but my mom was very, a very strict Seventh Day Adventist, and um, everything was about heaven. It wasn't about living now, it was about working, getting your way into heaven. Uh, that's where it was all at. And we also were taught not to, you know, no drinking, no smoking, no uh, coffee. You know, a lot of things were, were not allowed. And we had kind of the Old Old Testament version of, uh, of, of what you're supposed to eat. Okay. Like no unclean meats and so on. So there's probably some uh, some overlap there. Well, I think from from the so were you allowed to have like technology things like that? It was yeah to a degree. You know everything had like if it was sinful if it had a sinful content it was frowned on. You know so mm-hmm. what's what is sin? You know that's uh, it, it was better to and then of course on Saturdays that was the Sabbath from Friday evening to Saturday evening was the Sabbath. And we were not allowed to do much of anything during that time, except for religious things. Okay. So uh, what kind of impact or what kind of really influence did growing up in that environment have, or did it have any link to um, getting into crime, do you think? It was kind of the opposite of getting into crime. Uh, I think the rebellion that I that I had against it, and the fact that I I really didn't have any direction after that. You know, once I decided that the Seventh Day Adventist thing was not for me, um, I realized that I didn't really realize anything. I had no I had no direction, no compass, and <coughs> excuse me. I went, uh, I went out and discovered the world in my way. And uh, eventually, you know, I was very depressed. I had, I had mental issues. I was depressed and uh, anxious. Um, I just was very suicidal, actually. I, I didn't really want me until I found methamphetamine. And that was like what I call my first transformation in life. What, what do you mean by that? But by a transformation? It wasn't a good not a good transformation. Yeah. It, was, it was something that proved to me that you can alter your state. You can alter the way you look at things. And now, in this case, methamphetamine altered me immediately, instant gratification, instantly into a world that was exciting and, uh, and fun. And so that was the, the first, that, that was just basically what taught me that you could change. But I didn't know you could change for the better, and that came way later. Mm-hmm. Well, I definitely want to get into that. But before we get into that, let's uh, let's talk about what actually happened with uh, spending time in prison. So, what, what was the? How old were you the first time you were arrested? The first time you you spent some time in prison? I was arrested. I was arrested in my teens a couple of times. It was once for weed weed uh, possession and once for uh, getting so drunk at a concert that I ended up waking up in jail covered in blood, and, you know, just craziness, stuff like that. But 
I wasn't really a criminal. I didn't start the criminal thing till I first put a needle for methamphetamine in my arm and um, eventually had to find a way to support a habit. And that, that criminality eventually led to a, a sentence for burglary when I was 25. Kind of late. I'm a late bloomer when it comes to criminal. <laughs> so how, how long was that sentence and how much time did you serve? The first one I was sentenced, it, back in those days, it didn't mean much what they said your sentence was. It was seven years. I did nine months um, before I started a in and out sentence. And kind of, um, let's see, eight days in, six days out. And then after another, seven, after seven months of that, I was released. Um, so it was like 16 months I did. 16 months and then so what was that what was that experience like was it was it i mean obviously it's a shock but thinking back on it it didn't change you right away because you went three more times but did it make you did it did it hinder your life did it make it your situation worse or no i uh i thought you know i i couldn't see a reason why um, I would ever stop doing the meth because it, it was so great. It was the first great thing that ever happened to me, you know, in my mind. And uh, so while I was in there, I just thought about how can I be better at this? And, you know, I, the first time I did time, I didn't learn a whole lot. It was always, I always thought of it as a rite of passage in the manhood, things like that. I mean, I, I was such a, unhappy kid and the drugs made me a better a happy person in a way you know i don't know how to obviously it had its drawbacks but i thought that it was the best direction for me i started thinking sort of as an anti anti-social person you know kind of a, i just started thinking like a criminal do you think that was due to the influences around you, like friends you had at the time, or was it? Yeah, and it was a rebellion against what I'd been brought up as, and uh, and who I who I was. I didn't want to be who I was, so I was being something else, mm -hmm. and that was a great lesson that I learned way later. You know, um, way later on, I learned that I wanted to be who I who I am. I'm okay with it. You know, okay. that, the acceptance is a beautiful. It's a key thing in life. So you have this first sin in prison. You get out. Um, you're saying your, your mindset, really, while well, you were in prison, was you to get better at getting methamphetamine. Um, I take it that you probably didn't go through any rehab or anything in prison, or if you did, then uh, you didn't want to quit. I didn't pay much attention in those days. You know, I wasn't trying to change. So, and everything seemed like a lie to me. You know, that until you're ready for it, it, it just sounds like bullshit. You know? So what happened when you got out? I got out the first time I got back when my daughter was born. Um, she was uh, during that time, later on. And fortunately, by it wasn't too long into that. I had a, you know, I had a woman that I was, that was her mother, and we hung out, and we we got a place, and I tried to become a great drug dealer, and I was wasn't bad as far as just the dollars and cents of it, but it's, I was so naive, really, uh, coming from where I'd come from, that even at my age of, at this point, probably twenty six, um, twenty seven, in there. I was still just really not very good at it, you know, and, and I would get a job and I would lose the job and so forth. It was, it was just, um, it's kind of hard to remember those days, but they're, because they're pretty dark. They're not, there's nothing really happy to remember, so. Uh, I moved around. I went to Detroit, Michigan. I did some time there. I spent some time in Detroit. Ended up getting extradited here and there. It's just one thing after another. A lot of arrests. So let's 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 jump forward then. So what was it 
that after having these four different stints in prison all, all around the country, um, what was it that changed you? I mean, was it, can you point to a moment where something happened? Was it gradual? Absolutely. Uh, nothing happened the first three times. The fourth time I was going to get out and I was going to be late forties, you know, and I, I was having a hard time with that thinking, and there's nothing really to live for. So I, the whole time that I was in there for a few years, it was just depression and anxiety and not, not sleeping well and having bad dreams and thinking of suicide. And finally, um, after a lot of suicidal ideation, I eventually said, well, I, I have one more thing I can do. I can ask for help. And I put in a kite. I wrote this kite out, uh, inmate communication form to, uh, to the psych services. And I'm in prison. And, you know, it's kind of weird because you're like, you don't want to tell anybody you got a problem. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole deal. So actually doing that was the best thing I ever did, but it was anti everything that I'd been taught and believed. And it changed my life dramatically, just the act of putting the kite in there. And then when I went to, um, I went to the psych services of the doctor, they gave me some medication that um, helped me. And then I got into school as a drafter, computer aided drafting. And it's something I talk about all the time to people, how um, how a trade can change someone's life. It, it really changed my life. I realized I wasn't stupid. I realized I didn't need methamphetamine to be happy. I was happy. I Right there in prison, I started being freed because I was I was doing something with my life. You know? It felt good. Well, why specifically a, a trade? Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, uh, I just think that there's a lot of opportunities in trades. I think that uh, working with your hands and doing something that's contributing to, you can actually see the work you're doing, contributing to building things, creating things. Uh, that's, that, that can transform, that can be very transformative, you know. Uh, I was able to, it, it could have been, carpentry, it could have been an electrician, uh, any of these things could have been great for me if I had, if, if, but the choice was computer and drafting, that was it. And maybe for me, it was especially good because I'm kind of a artist, you know, and I like to create. And what I used with, what I did with this, uh, the skill that I learned in drafting was actually a mindset that I was able to apply later on in life. Uh, and to, to many things, including the bread. Mm -hmm. But uh, lots of people, uh, I think I've seen so many other people, you know, find a trade, get into a trade, and it's not something that they have to go to a lot of school for. They can kind of work right into something. And uh, I've, just, I've just seen so much of it happen. It's, it makes a big difference. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. We actually had a guy on, couple episodes ago, uh, Michael Monsivice, he's out in LA and he's a welder and he was, while he was in prison, he actually started, he worked with the prison system to start a welding program inside the prison, which I mean, I think that's fantastic. So guys can get released and then, you know, have a, have a job, have a skill that they can immediately work in, which I don't know why we're not doing that more across the board in the prison system. I mean, oh, I have I'm working on I'm working at it. It's one of my goals. It's one of my the things I want to see happen. And uh, you know, I, you're talking about the, one of the cool things about that is you can get right into work. And you know, a lot of construction people will allow ex felon mm -hmm. ex felons in because it's not as risky on a lot of dishonesty levels and stuff. Uh, it's it's very great, you know. A person can prove themselves pretty quickly whether they're um, whether they're a good employee or not in that trade. In a trade, right? Yeah, you you can measure it with, with welding. If you're having you know a bunch of bad wells that aren't passing inspection, you're not going to cut it very long. It's like just like with anything else. But uh, 
So, so from there, so how long did you work in, uh, in drafting for? I had a few years left to do. I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to have like six more years, but they let me out early because I, they put me into this drug okay. program. So was, the drug program, um, when I found out I was going into this program, I was not too happy, even though it was going to get me out early because I felt like I was on a great path with the, with this computer aided drafting. Mm -hmm. So the total amount of drafting that I did probably was uh, two, two and a half years. And then I uh, was transferred over to this drug program. And it was a great test of my new attitude in life. My attitude was, uh, hey, whatever comes, I'm going to meet it head on and do the best I can and be okay with failure and and success just be be good and so i got into this program and it wasn't it wasn't easy it was hard it was kind of there was a lot of you know headbutt in there and i i managed to get through it and then it was time to get out so when you got out you did you end up using the drafting when you were out or or no not specifically i used the ideas i used principles that i learned in drafting. They came in very handy. I used, like for instance, I realized that I needed to replicate products that were already out there for me to be able to improve on them. Mm -hmm. So that's the same thing you do in drafting. You replicate other things and you find ways to improve those, you know, working with other people and such. Uh, I did that with bread. So same, same deal. So, so how, so this, this was your family business, right? Like how big was before, before you, I guess, got involved again, how big was the business at that time? I think there was a, uh, something like a million dollars, million and a half or something like that sales every year mm -hmm. at that time. And that isn't a whole lot of profit for, for the company because it's very slim margins. Um, so, you know, my brother was able to make a pretty decent living running this, but what, what they were selling was private label products. Uh, there was no real branding. It was just, uh, you know, Trader Joe's needed certain items for their bread lines and certain, and, and so my brother was able to, uh, to, to make that happen. So, how did you take it from the situation where you're just making private label, just filling orders, you're not really building a brand? Well, I guess what wanted, what, where did the desire, where did the passion come from to do that? I guess, first of all, change it. It was a necessity, really. Uh, the need was there. The company, in order for me to get any sort of equity in the company, I had to make a mark somehow. And my brother gave me the, uh, he supported me in the idea of uh, creating new products. And, and I started out by um, updating the, the cookie line that they had at the time to being without trans fats and, and I, without eggs, and but they became vegan. Um, so it was just like, it was a good warm up toward the bread. I, I had a couple of months where I worked on cookies and, but the bread was a, a bigger opportunity and a much bigger challenge uh, because there's so much competition and there's people eat bread all the time, every day, right? Most people. Uh, so there's plenty of market, but the big guys dominated. And to be with those guys, I had to come up with something better. And that's, that's really what my challenge was. You know, so, you know to me, that's, that's something to be passionate about. I, you know, I enjoyed it. But yeah, I don't think you can underestimate how really how hard it is. And there's probably, there's a couple of probably food markets, like probably a lot of food markets are like a cereal, where it is so hard to different, differentiate yourself. But like, just for example, when I uh, posted in our, we have a, a Facebook group. And I posted that you were going to be coming on the show. I said, Dave's Killer Bread is one of my favorite breads. 
it had the like the most comments that we've had <laughs> we've had on a post because everybody recognizes the name. But if you talked about I don't know Petridge Farms bread, that's not going to fire anybody up. But something even with people not knowing your backstory, just that name and there's like a it's like a following to it. Well, there is like a like a cult following with it, but. Yeah, I'm kind of out of the out of the loop when it comes to Dave's Killer Bread now. But I I feel like it's time to take advantage of that distribution by getting myself out there, uh, to do, doing some speaking and things. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. So let's let's talk about um, the process of the branding of it. How did you how did you approach really? Everything, I mean, everything from the label to the name, what, what was the process there? It was very natural. Coming from prison, I had, a, I was a blues player, music, guitar player. Uh, coming out, I did a lot of playing while I was in there. I developed my, my blues chops. And blues bread had a good ring to it. So I was going to make a loaf of my, a variety called blues bread and another one called killer bread. And I didn't know what the killer was going to be, but I was going to name it. I was going to create it around that name, just like I was going to create blues bread around the name. Blues, blues bread still exists, um, but killer bread was changed to nuts and grains. And then, uh, but long story short, I would I would name a bread. I would envision a bread, uh, and then I would create based on that vision. Um, and so the, the actual creating of the product was pretty straightforward in that um, I would create around a name and I would just work and make mistakes and practice until it was perfect. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was that part of the process. And then, but calling it killer bread, it just kind of stuck. Everything became killer bread. It had its own individual name of its variety, mm -hmm. but it was all killer. And, you know, it was kind of risky because people, some people don't like that name killer, you know. Um, but to me, it was natural. It was just a natural name for my bread. And uh, my, my brother, I originally thought we were just going to make more Nature Bake, which was the brand, sort of brand that my dad uh, began. I thought I would just make it a, a bread under that label. And uh, we, my brother didn't want to do that. He wanted to make it a new, a new brand for several reasons. But hmm. uh, so it, it kind of totally separate, you know. And my idea was to always was to make it as part of the family and the extension of the family. But he wanted it to be separate from that so that it would appeal to a different audience. Uh, I think the bread would have appealed to whoever, no matter what we did on the marketing. But uh, was, as far as getting that, you know, everybody liked the bread. I went to the farmer's markets. You know, that's that's a great opportunity. You know, going to the farmer's market, testing mm -hmm. it out. Um, but I had to come up, you know, we had a lawyer we were talking to. Once we had a product that we knew people liked, it was like, okay, Dave's Killer Bread. Um, now, how do we how do we, how do we make that stand out as a, with a, a logo and you know, packaging and stuff? Mm -hmm. My brother's original idea was to have me um, a picture of me with my guitar on the back of the bag and me writing my story. I, I wrote the story, but after talking to the attorney, the copyright attorney. I knew um, I started drawing this idea of a logo, and it was a picture of this guy who represented me with his guitar, mm -hmm. drawn drawn on a brick wall, and then Dave's bread in big block letters, and somebody comes along with a red spray paint can and tags "Killer" over the top of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, it doesn't. It never ended up being that in the logo. It's impossible to make a logo out of that, as far as I can know. <laughs> so this is what ended up happening, and uh, rest is history, I guess. That's that's pretty cool. So, how many years were you? I guess what, how long was the run with Dave's Killer Bread before you before you sold it? You said it was like a two part sale, or. 
Yeah, it's two parts. So started in August of 2008, and uh, or five, 2005. And we sold the first part in around just the beginning of 2012. So seven years, it was, it was seven years and we had gotten to the point where it was too hard to handle. You know, it's too big, it's too big for us. Um, and then three more years and it was all gone. Had, had you guys expanded, I assume you would have had to expand production, you know, when, you, yeah. when that happened. Yeah, my brother actually had to um, basically put up his house in order for us to expand to, to a bigger place so that we could make, uh, keep up with the demand. Mm-hmm. That's the thing about, about growing a business that has a lot of, that, that requires a lot of materials. Um, it's so expensive to, to finance that growth. And there was a lot of times when we just weren't sure we were going to make it because we we're growing so fast. Yeah, which is crazy to think about, but that that does happen. You you grow too fast to kill yourself. Yeah, and then you also have these the big guys, you know, waiting for you to screw up so they can, you know, so they can take over from where you left off. Mm-hmm. And they they're always trying. They've tried all their little, little tricks, like buying buying this out for really cheap. You know, it, it, it looked like a lot of money at the time that they offered us, but it wasn't. And we knew it wasn't, so we didn't know it wasn't going to happen. Um, and then they actually sent a spy to learn all of our stuff and really? created, created their own. I had Good Seed, and that's my favorite of my breads. It's called Good Seed. Mm-hmm. And they uh, came along with Great Seed. So, <laughs> you know, Good Seed actually has meaning for me. It's like my transformation. Uh, that's I created the bread around the around my transformation. I have a big good seed tattoo on my back. So, a, a big part of uh, you know your of Dave's Killer Bread is the employing of you know people with a criminal history, right? Is that still going on today, or is that was that a <laughs> chapter? I think it is. From what I can tell, that's. That's part of the the creed, you know. Um, I when I started doing it, it was just simply because it was the right thing to do. The, mm-hmm. There's there's good people out there that nobody wants because they're ex felons, you know. So why not get those good people? Um, made a lot of mistakes in hiring, but you know, there's a lot of excellent people that have been in trouble. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, or, or every time I do this show, it's really, it's incredible. And, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, a story like yours, and so, so many stories that we've had on this show, I think it serves as motivation for not just people who have a criminal history and have made mistakes, but also people who, you know, maybe they're in a, they're in a job they don't like, or they, you know, they have a business that failed. I mean, you can come back from, from anything. So if you could if you could just speak to maybe you know some of some of the I don't know I hate using the word tricks maybe some of the the methods or or things you leaned on really to uh, to push yourself through maybe tough times or times when you doubted yourself while you were growing this business. Yeah, I think the the most powerful lessons I learned were um, humility because. Humility to me means just not being any more or less than you are. Just being, it's, it's so basic and so great. It makes, it, and acceptance is probably the very best word that, that I know. Because if you accept your, your circumstances as they are, when you can't do anything about it, mm-hmm. then you're successful. You're, that's success in itself. That doesn't mean you want to stay there you're going to do something about it but you're going to accept what where you're at right now and it, it just it, it's calming it's uh it opens your mind to positive uh outcomes 
instead of thinking, oh my God, I'm panicking and, you know, and thinking less of yourself and less of the world. I mean, all the negative thoughts that enter your mind don't have to be there. You accept the, the truth exactly as it is and you make it better. I like that that's, a lot. That's always been my, that's always been a key to my success. Where, where did you learn that? Do you remember? It's kind of a, over, over time. Uh, part of it comes from the 12 steps. Uh, you know, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our uh, lives would become unmanageable. Uh, but you learn the, it, it's like, it's more like a serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's so simple and it works every time. Um, and so it was the beginning of it was when I got the medication for my depression because I was doing something about it, you know. I was accepting myself as I was, but I was doing something about it. And uh, from that point on, I looked at the corrections officers and others, and I just forgave them. It's like, this is the way it is. But what good does it do me to trip and have a bad day because these guys want me to? You know, I'm just going to let it go, brush it off. And... Uh, all through my life since then, even when I made major, major mistakes, I was able to forgive myself and forgive others. That makes a big difference. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I, I think, I mean, so many people just throughout their personal life, not even dealing with success in business, but I think so much of the world today is just structured. I don't, I don't think it's intentional. But with like the, the news media, cable news, everything is like designed to throw people off, put them in fear a little bit. And you're right, man. That's that's so dangerous. That's so dangerous. It's, it's hard to watch uh, that negativity. It's because you know there's games going on. You know, it's all games. And, you know, an idea doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily there for that idea. It's there as a, as a manipulation tactic mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think having a simple life uh, my life is as simple as I can make it you know it's very busy I got a lot going on but I I have a very simple structure foundation in my life and, and it all comes from acceptance and humility gratitude and forgiveness well, speaking about you having a lot going on in your life, one of the things is a, a podcast that uh, that you started. I think was it earlier this year that you started it? Or yeah. okay, so yeah, tell us about that podcast, uh, the name of it, why you started it, and really what's the what's the goal, the vision for it? Well, it's pretty close to the same name as yours, almost. Uh, <laughs> it's got the main word felony. Yeah. Mine's felony Inc. Yours is felony Fridays. Uh, Somebody else had the idea that they came up to me and said, um, and they, they produced these several different uh, podcasts. It's called the Startup Radio Network. And I did, I was a guest on somebody else's podcast or a guest uh, host. And then they asked me if I wanted to do my own. And they said, well, you know, what do you think about doing a podcast where you interview ex-felon entrepreneurs? And I'm like, damn, that would be great. I mean, so it's not, because, I don't do the podcast because uh, for any other reason really than because I feel like it, it, it matters to talk to these guys. Mm -hmm. I enjoy talking to them and I, I like, uh, I think that it makes a difference. You know? Yeah. Not I don't make any money at it. Yeah, that's that's the that's the big secret in podcasting. There's no money in it. Yeah, yeah, you gotta do it for another reason. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've listened to a couple of the episodes, and honestly, man, I'm probably gonna go back in the backlog and listen to as many as I can because it, it is it's compelling stuff. And we've had a couple guests that that I've had on my show too. So there's some overlap. I know one you had uh, Cosmarte 
Oh, yeah. Bon Body. He's, he's, a, he's a good bon guy. That's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, right. Those guys um, are inspirational. The transformation is very meaningful. I think, you know, it's, it's a great subject. I I plan on doing another podcast eventually that's more wide-ranging, not just about felons. It's, mm-hmm. it's going to be about people, other people who've overcome things. Uh, I think the ingredients and their kind of principles are universal. It's not just ex-felon entrepreneurs. It's everyone. Right. Everyone can learn from these. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So uh, before I let you go, you've been you know, really uh, generous with your time here. Dave, appreciate that. I know you're a busy guy, but if you can just let people know, um, just plug whatever you want to, where they can find your podcast, where they can find your website, where they can uh, do all that good stuff. Yeah, I think the best thing to do is come to my – my website's a little behind right now. You know, I'm, I'm in the works of a lot of things, but you can kind of keep up with me on uh, DaveDahl360.com. Uh, you can come to one of my Facebook pages. I have a few. I have a, a band called The Killer Granddaddies. It's kind of a fun little project that I, that I do. Um, I also – one of the ways that I healed up – from a bad incident that happened in 2013 was uh, I got into African art of all things. Uh, it's like the last thing in the world anybody would expect me to get into and that's kind of why I did it because it's, it has nothing to do with me, you know. And it's good sometimes to be able to forget about yourself and, and that's what I did with it. Uh, but I sell African art now. Uh, but it, it's, it's a very niche market. There's not a whole lot of people into it. So, so do you do you travel over over to Africa to, to look no, at it? No, because um, now in 2013 I had an incident where uh, it doesn't make any sense, no matter how you put it, but I, I ran into three cop cars in Washington County. And it's totally, no matter how you look at it, it's misunderstood, but it was a result of the success and drinking and uh, just losing my baby. I mean, it was a it was a weird time, and uh, when that happened, it kind of set me a, a new chain of events going. And I went to um, I wasn't able to go to Africa. They, my my travel was restricted. Okay. So it came to me. You'd be surprised how many Africans like to sell uh, African. Yeah, that's, that's how they there's make no, money. So, yeah. there's, there's no cultural appropriation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't check to make sure you're African. Anyone uh, can buy it. So, yeah. uh, they know who likes the African art. It's not Africans. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Um, well, they, yeah. Thanks thanks again, man, for coming on. This has been uh, this has been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, deaf people should. Check out check out the website. What is it? Dave Doll three hundred and sixty, right? And uh, check out the podcast. Felony Inc. All right. All right. We'll nice see you, man. Uh, take care. Hope you guys enjoy that interview with Dave Doll. And you know, I'm not going to drone on for very long here at the conclusion because I think the important stuff already happened during the episode. So. You might want to go back and listen to the episode again because there are some gems in there. I just want to highlight one gem that I'm going to take away and apply to my life right now um, every single day, and I think it's going to help tremendously. When Dave was talking about really being able to be content with where you are, understand where you are today, be grateful for what you, for what you have today, and then use that calmness to be able to be creative and uh, solve, have a creative mindset, a problem-solving mindset to be able to seize opportunities and grow. And I think that is so important. And it's really, it's not something that I've, I've heard said the way that Dave related it. You know, people talk about gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. But for some reason, it just clicked with me there when he was talking about it. Just clicked that, you know, I think it's a problem, as I said to Dave, across culture today, Nobody's content. Nobody is content. Very, it's rare. It is a very rare thing to find somebody, even who's very successful, who is content. 
and happy with where they are, grateful for where they are uh, in the moment. You know, I really struggle with that. And, you know, I, I think that it can be very, very powerful to be able to accept where you are and just understand that accepting where you are today does not mean that you accept where uh, the same thing today 10 years from now. You can accept where you are right now because where you are right now is a collection of all the decisions you've made that put you here. So the only reason that you're here right now, of course, there are external influences, things that can happen. But for the most part, even those external influences, your decision making had a role in that that led you to this point today. So accept it. Accept the bad things that happened. Accept the bad luck. Accept the poor decisions. Accept the mistakes. And this goes across the board for people who have made terrible mistakes, who are in prison, who have got out and they can't find work, they can't find housing, they can't find anything. Um, it goes for those people. And it also goes for people who, it, it sounds weird to relate these two people as being on a similar, to have a similar mindset. But I think there's people who have been out of prison who have nothing. And there's people who have a full-time job and are just as upset and unsatisfied with the state of life and where they are today, the state of the country. I think some people are, they look at CNN and Fox News and the sky is following the world's ending. But to be able to just say, just take a deep breath and just relax and understand things can get better. Things will get better. Things are getting better. And it starts with changing yourself and changing your mindset. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense. I think it made more sense when, when Dave talked about it. But it's a great, great time talking with this guy. This is somebody who's had wild success. Hopefully you guys gleaned, um, you know, some – some wisdom off of the episode and uh, you know, maybe I'll have Dave back on in, in a little while. And I'm sure there's a, you know, there's more to his story. He had about an hour today, which we, we approached uh, getting through that, but you know, that's it. And I just want to say one more thing, please consider joining the lions of Liberty pride. We are going to be running a promotion and the promotion is going to have to do with getting some, extra per some perks that have never been offered before um, you're going to be able to get um, by joining the pride just for five dollars a month and it's going to be for a limited time it's going to be a window where you can get it so if you've been putting off joining the lions of liberty pride if you've been saving your money um, think about uh, joining this month because there's not going to be really a better time to join and honestly guys um, this is we're, we're nearing a pivot point here. We're nearing a very important point for the Alliance of Liberty. And we're going to be making some key decisions and would love to have your support. would love to have you on board because the more, um, the more supporters we have, the more subscribers we have, some more flexibility <clears throat> for our decision-making process going forward. So consider doing that. Go to patreon.com slash lines of Liberty. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And I think I can speak for Brian and Mark as well. They are very thankful. So that's all I got. And yeah, so this is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires of Liberty burning.